So my name is Brian. I'm an engineer at Quantopian. I just want to give a brief intro for our speaker, Michael. He is a, the CEO of Data Capital Management, the event-driven hedge fund based on big data technologies and data feeds. He is passionate about investing, technology, and the onset of the data economy. Michael earned his BA from Harvard College with honors in economics and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So first off, very excited to be here, and I want to thank everybody for, who was in person for taking the time to come into this room, particularly given, uh, as I mentioned, all the other speeches of tremendous uh, thought leaders that are taking place at this time. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Michael Beal. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself, uh, how we came to be as an organization uh, as we go through this talk. But to the very beginning, I think that I have a understanding of a little bit of the layout, but I'd ask a few questions just to make sure that I am speaking to the target audience, and then for those on live stream, wherever the camera may be, uh, I'll assume that the distribution of this room is fairly uh, representative of the distribution of the online audience. Uh, so first, I see a few people here that I truly respect, uh, particularly point seven two, uh, in terms of the real focus around the uh, data economy. Uh, but I'd ask of the uh, people in the room, how many people have heard of the data economy, have really thought about the implications to the capital markets, uh, and believe that it's really going to impact their daily lives and their positions? Get a hand up. Perfect. Uh, then the next question I have is in terms of passions that people have or how they describe their avocation uh, around the structuring of data and the extraction of information. So if you'd say that your real passion is about finding information uh, to leverage for decisions, if, if you call yourself that. Perfect. If it's around the analysis of information uh, and what to actually do with that, uh, if you might put your hands up. Perfect. And then my last question would be around how people think about how alpha is derived. So if you think about alpha in terms of a uh, statistical variance or a spread uh, between two statistical securities and that that's really what drives your alpha. Uh, may you put your hands up? That's actually very interesting. Thank you. And then, so my other question would be in terms of, if you think about it in terms of future free cash flows, the impacts of DCS, uh, identifying names that you believe are going to have better growth uh, versus lower growth to the market, and that's what really drives alpha. Uh, maybe you can put your hands up there. Very good. Okay. So as we go through this, and this will come up as we uh, speak later, um, but let's dive directly into it. <clears throat> so I'll speak a little bit more about what data capital management is and very... Uh, appreciative of the members of our firm who are in the room. Uh, but why are we here? The page, page that you see up here, and I'll try to stay still, is an adaptation of a page that we sent to Quantopian about a year and a half ago. Uh, and when we first launched, I think we were interested in some of the approaches that technologically that Quantopian had deployed. And so we said, let's see if we might be able to deploy a couple of strategies. Uh, and one of the strategies was just a pure price volume strategy, so we thought it might be appropriate to deploy on there platform. Uh, and as most things go, uh, our first strategy was $2 million, and I think there were some issues. And uh, we believe that excuses are tools of the incompetent. So we worked incredibly hard, and we fixed those issues. Uh, but at the end of the day, we went to Madison Square Park, uh, and our office is about a block or two away from there to celebrate, and Napoleon, Chris will remember this. Uh, and I get a phone call on my cell phone, and uh, it's the person saying, hey, you know, I heard about all these issues that you guys had. Why don't you tell me about it? And I'm more, hey, we just fixed it. I don't really want to talk about it. But I'll go through it very quickly. And as you'll see, I'm a very excitable person. Uh, and as I come back to the table, my team says, hey, who is that? Why, who are you going off on? And I said, I don't know. It's some guy, John Fawcett. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. And they all have that same example. How do you not know who this person is? He's going to cut off our trades and the lights. And so I go back online. I pull out my phone. And I'm like, oh. The CEO. Oh, great. Um, so in any case, what I was really truly respected about John was that through that encounter, he asked to get many of his lead product engineers on the phone call uh, so that we could walk them through the issues that we faced and ways that they could get better. And so this is really what we did with uh, Quantopian, but we do with anybody that we work with. Uh, we are really focused around the data economy and the things that are going to come to fruition. Uh, and therefore, we have set ourselves up to be early adopters of any types of technology. Uh, with a goal of trying to help people bring this uh, to the level of sophistication that is required for all of us to uh, take advantage of these new opportunities. Uh, and so the real purpose of this conversation is something very similar to this. 
uh, in that we are not academics, right? And we can, we all, we'll only talk about data capital management so if you have the context of uh, the conversation that we're gonna have. But we are not academics, right? We are a systematic hedge fund. We're deploying millions of dollars every day. We're doing about 80 trades per day based upon the things that we're gonna talk about. And as a result of that, it's incredibly important for us to leverage the entire ecosystem. Uh, and our goal is to really try to drive interest in the things that we're trying to do. Uh, for the people that have a, as we mentioned here, back to the Adam Smith, uh, selfish best interests. If you, this talk is to very clearly identify what our selfish best interests are, how we view the world, and if there are others who have congruent interests to ours, please shoot us an email, uh, whether it's in the form of you're a data supplier, you're somebody else who's diving into this, please let us know. We want to be compatriots in arms. So as we mentioned, uh, we're a systematic hedge fund. We like to say that if Google and JP Morgan gave birth to a hedge fund, data capital management is what you would get. Uh, we have a team of MBAs who have their training from you know, 25 billion plus uh, institutional investment firms, uh, a team of PhDs in quantitative research uh, who were the core uh, team for JP Morgan. And then we have a group of people who have never set foot inside of a financial institution a day in their lives. And I had to convince them that it wouldn't be as bad as they thought it would be. They spent their entire time out on the West Coast focused on those technologies. And what we focus in on is the uh, bringing together various types of investment approaches, uh, whether it be fundamental analysis, traditional quantitative analysis, with a real focus on novel data sources. And we're able to do that because of our passion for integrating uh, massive amounts of heterogeneous data and our focus on parallel compute processing uh, and cognitive technologies to bring that all together. And just on a very high level, we believe in the efficient markets hypothesis that new unexpected information drives changes in asset prices. You can see a couple of those examples here. I believe that we all uh, can understand that. But then we also understand that just doing a very simple buy and hold off of some new unexpected information. Uh, and what's important for us is news is really just any new information that comes. In the current economy, uh, it comes through a distribution pipeline of the major distributors, which have gone from you know, 30 in the 90s to about five now. But in reality, it's just any piece of information. Each one of you are delivering it right now. There's just not a way to very really systematically capture it. Uh, so we take all of this information and we combine it through either mean reversion, momentum, or some level of standalone event-based strategies. Uh, so that's what we do. The only reason I'm speaking about that is so that people know this is not an uh, academic talk. This is something very serious to us uh, for which we have burnt the bridge behind us and have gone all in around the data economy and the best ways to bring alpha out of that. So let's talk about this. What is it that the data economy is and why are we bringing it? So my background is that uh, after graduating with distinction from Harvard uh, and while I was in business school there, we had this idea about how the data economy was gonna impact capital markets. Uh, and I can summarize it very simply in terms of how you know, we created the first big data business for J.P. Morgan Chase and the, the fairly fundamental premise was that they sit on the sixth largest data reserve in the world and they do nothing with it. Not only do they do nothing with it, they enable third parties uh, in the forms of credit bureaus and anybody else who created what's called a give to get contract to go about commercializing that data on their behalf. Some of our favorite companies, Market for example, they wouldn't be able to exist if not for the data that they're able to aggregate from all the different banks, bring that together into a consolidated feed and then charge an exorbitant amount to hedge funds like us uh, to be able to take action upon that. And that general process is something that is occurring across every single firm in every, in every boardroom across the world. This idea that we all are sitting on a tremendous amount of value uh, and there is a desire to start to capture that dead weight loss that is created from that externality of not having an ability to commercialize it through the form of what we call APIs. And if you see on the back of our card, it always says got API. And that core thought is that all of these intellectual property and intellectual property assets that we have all amassed and held in our little uh, basements and factories is now something that we can expose to the world in a way that, not, that does not truly uh, impede our competitive differentiation, but really enables us an entirely new way to amortize the fixed costs that we have already created through the desire to structure all of this data for our internal uses. And then eventually there will be somebody like me or somewhere else who comes around and says, hey, why don't you just point that API externally? And as long as you can manage the entitlements around that, you can really commercialize and create an entirely new value stream. And what's going to occur as that, as that happens 
And uh, last thing, right now, you know, it's the PayPal's of the world, but it will be very large organizations. Uh, I cannot think of in 20 years a single organization that is not commercializing some level of its intellectual property, uh, and it will really just be a function as to what's the value depending upon what's the depth and the breadth of their information. So when that occurs, this is why we're so excited. Because when that occurs, that is the data economy that we've all spoken about. Uh, and the, the first industrial revolution occurred you know, back in the 1800s, uh, when it was really about the transformation of the way that uh, labor was then put into fixed inputs. And now what we're talking about is the way that all of our kind of actions and the externalities of our actions are now coming in to be created as a real tangible asset. And when that occurs, an entire new ecosystem of companies, uh, ranging from the estimizes that are creating crowd sources um, to the, you know, the splunks for those who use that in terms of the ability to aggregate it, uh, but really an entirely new ecosystem is going to occur from that. And we are positioning ourselves for that. And so if you step back and you say, what are the challenges that this new data economy creates for investors? Well, another thing to know about me is that I never started as a quantitative investor. Right? I was a very core fundamental investor. After Harvard College, I went over to mergers and acquisitions at Morgan Stanley. And then when you're ranked in the top 10% globally, you get to go on to one of the large private equity firms. So I went to TPG Capital. And I was really focused around that. Uh, I've also am a student of history, and so it focused around the investment processes of venture capital, long, short equity, quantitative investing. And at the end of the day, we are all doing the exact same thing, regardless of the way that we like to portray our alpha and our differentiation to our investors. At the end of the day, what are we looking for? We're looking to seek value. After we've identified value, we're looking to optimize some level of a transaction structure. From there, we're trying to manage our risk and get the execution done at the most optimal approach. And then we're looking to monitor our portfolios and hopefully have as little intervention as possible. And then after that, we want to exit and monetize. And so if you break it down from the very differences across the various investment approaches to that kind of scalable process, then what is the challenge that any given investor faces? It's the ability to deal with the breadth of information, but also to be able to deal with the depth and the intricacies that the details occur. And that's kind of where private equity makes its mark around diligence. Uh, and then it's about the ability to do speed. And either it's speed in terms of your execution in the public markets or it's speed in terms of the process flow of how you go from your early warning memo to uh, your final investment memorandum. But there is some level of speed to take this idea of breadth and depth and actually make that actionable. And in order to make that actionable in a manner that will produce sustainable alpha, we tend to believe that people need experience. Um, and so that tends to it show itself in terms of the way to understand that you know, the investment process is not that difficult. At the end of the day, all we are asking is the same question over and over and over. Should I buy this company or should I sell this company? And we do a lot of different ways about getting to that answer. But our answer is really just a function of a lot of different independent variables coming through some level of a optimization schema, which is either in our head or programmed into a computer. And therefore, the answer to that question of should I buy or should I sell changes in terms of its dependent variable. But it's really just a function of the fluctuations that are going through the independent variables and any changes that you're making to your analysis. So this is really the way that I see the investment process and the, the challenges for everybody, regardless of whether you're a quantitative, systematic, long, short, or private equity investor. And so what is the challenges that are, that are created there? Well, we've always known that data is important. Right? Even back in the 1950s, people were looking at data to some level. The problem is, as I mentioned, we are moving from a world where data was very centralized and delivered to us on a weekly basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, depending on what it is that you care about, to now it is just going all time. And we can still choose to rely upon some level of an aggregator to give it to us in a digestible manner. But that's a choice now, whereas that was a requirement before. And so those who are really focused upon uh, diving into the data economy will see that I no longer need to make my investment decisions truly based upon the information release of some distributor, but now I have the ability to consistently update my models, consistently update my understanding of the world based upon real-time information, and now these distributions, which we still understand the rest of the world is paying attention to, just become new kind of tests and validations of whatever our analysis is on a real-time basis. 
This is something that machines can deal with, but it's going to be very difficult uh, for humans, particularly given the way that you have to scatter humans to catch each one of uh, those types of information sources that are growing. And then the other problem that we have here, I'm sorry, I'm going to break my rule about moving. Um, <clears throat> the other problem that we have here is around the way the world has just gotten so complex. Right? There was a time where you could say, okay, I need to make an investment on this name and I need to understand the ecosystem of that name. And you could go into a 10K and you could figure out whether we're the top 10% of suppliers, top 10% of revenue, and then you could go down, maybe you look at some McKinsey reports. But at the end of the day, you could either give that to an analyst to create an Excel model around, or you could give that to an engineer to create very defined SQL uh, query tables around, and boom, you have an understanding of how your name uh, re is, is a function of the movements of its kind of very close, call it a two-level query uh, type of relationship. But this is the problem that we're moving into. That's no longer acceptable, right? Uh, we are in a true chaos theory type of an environment. And if you don't have the ability to understand how this random dot reflects to McDonald's and therefore reflects to what I believe is Ford in the middle of that, that graph, you're going to see things that you believe are completely random, but it's because you can't actually see the linkages in the chain behind it. And so when you have such a broad approach to understanding the relationships, predefined SQL queries are no longer useful. It will not work anymore. And therefore, you have to have a much more complex and an abstract approach to understanding and identifying relationships that previously uh, were obfuscated from the investor's mind. This is really core, and I think it's going to be one of the key things that unless a fundamental investor incorporates this type of machine learning into their process flow, it's just not going to work for them. And this is really the core thing. One of the things, the other thing that I learned about the investment industry, and when I was at TPG, uh, I worked very closely for their chief investment officer about a month after we lost WAMA. And one of the things that I learned there was that investors, to some extent, are there to provide confidence to their LP clients, particularly during times of stress. And that confidence comes as a result of going through repeated cycles, standing as the person on the world on the edge and understanding what the opportunities and the key risks are going to be during that. But the problem is that as people have gone through those cycles and their experience goes up, processing power starts to go down memory starts to go down. It's just a core limitation associated with human investors. So as such, in a world that now we have moved from, you know, this, this cartoon was done in 1989, but that cycle of, of euphoria and panic probably took at least a day to play itself out. Now this occurs in, I don't know, five seconds, uh, where you have a bad event, you already have a 15% down, and then you're already back up 5% uh, associated with that. So in that type of a world where you're being swung around with the volatility and the momentum, it's not surprising that many of our fundamental investing counterparts are having trouble uh, in this new economy. And while I do agree with his overall take here uh, in terms of we have come regretfully to the conclusion that the current algorithmically driven market environment is one in which, uh, is, one in which is increasingly incompatible with our fundamental research-oriented investment process, I would highlight the word out. Because fundamental research-oriented investment processes will continue. It is core. However, the way that different investors go about doing that and the amount of batch-based processes within that investment decision, that is going to have to truly change. And really, that is the future of quantitative investing. It will make its way from just a core uh, kind of high-frequency or low-latency approach to being able to move up into the stream into much more batch-based decision-making processes. So I gave you a little bit of a preview of that, but let's talk a little bit about why, why we believe that. So we talked again about the fundamental, the process is the same across all types of investors, across all types of asset classes, and it's really about the way one goes about executing. Uh, so in that world, when we think about the data acquisition, the analysis, and the decision, what are the real challenges that it faces? As we mentioned, volume and variety. Uh, and then what I really want to highlight is around the veracity of the information. And then finally, the decision and the velocity required to make that decision. So let's try to take each one of these point by point. So in comparison to the uh, human-based fundamental approach, when you look at the need to pull in massive amounts of information, on the left what you see is actually a way that we go about pulling out some of this information. 
And the key takeaway there is that everything that we do is parallel. Right? We're never going sequentially in terms of the types of information that we're asking. We're taking in as fine a granularity of the information buckets as we can break that down into sharding. And then from there, we're trying to have each computer go about pulling each one of them. Now, in a historical batch base, does not really matter? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But in real time, in order to pull all this information together and to do in-memory processing on it, you absolutely have to have an ability to pull everything up together and not have to wait to just go through the sequential process of getting your information before you start the process of making a decision. Uh, so that is incredibly important and there are tremendous strides that are taking place on the West Coast around parallel processing and in-memory compute and that's really where we, uh, where we live. Um, the other portion around that is that Data capital management, we are not a high frequency firm, but we are incredibly latency sensitive. We are a low latency firm. And what that creates is a really challenging problem around uh, resource management and provision. Uh, because essentially, if we see an event, we need to be able to act upon that as quickly as possible, as quickly as a high frequency firm would do. But there's a difference between having a fighter jet that is able to go at the speed of sound and trying to get your Ferrari to go from zero to 60 uh, in the fastest amount as, pos as possible. Uh, that initial one, I think that the people in high frequency trading and many of Wall Street have done a very good job around getting real power if you're willing to have that, cre uh, that core amount of uh, processing behind it. But for us, you know, we're very cost sensitive. So the idea that we would have a lot of resources just sitting there idle waiting for something to come through it does not work for us. We need to be able to, when there's nothing going on, scale down. And when there is something going on, be able to throw as many machines as possible such that we can live up to our vision of being able to take action on any given unexpected event in under five seconds. Uh, this is something that regardless of the amount of humans that you throw at a problem, it, it's not particularly going to help. <coughs> and so now we, let's talk about the analysis layer. And we all know, and I'm actually a big fan of IBM, right? And for, the, for better or worse, what I love about them is the amount of marketing that they're putting behind the cognitive computing era, um, which is doing a much better job than I could ever around trying to get people to be more interested in this space and drive the innovations. Uh, but what they do say and what they acknowledge is that we are in the early stages of cognitive computing. Now, I would say that it's good enough that it won Jeopardy, it won chess, and what I was most impressed by is that it won Go. Uh, and for those who understand and know anything about Go, it's a game where there is not really a restricted rule set, uh, and therefore that real, true, unsupervised learning that it was able to demonstrate through that uh, is, a, is truly encouraging, and certainly we talk about that. But most importantly is that machine learning is all based upon rapid iteration and rapid improvement upon the learning set. And so when you also think about not only our passion for the capital markets and our passion for investing, but as a pure technologist and a scientist, the capital markets create a very fertile ground for machine learning uh, in the sense that as we focus in on 3,000 given names every single day, every single millisecond, there is some name reacting to changes in asset prices based upon some independent variable. Uh, and when you combine that with a public market approach where you know, best in class is 55 to 60 percent correct, and you can limit the downside of your mistakes through tight stop losses, it really creates a very interesting uh, arena uh, for machine learning. And this is something that is really core to the data economy and why I think that this is very special. In that, when I worked at J.P. Morgan, I was, you know, they said that I was the fastest promoted in their history uh, to vice president. I'm sitting on the management committee and our team reports into the operating committee of the firm. Uh, but one of the things that I learned is that even as investors, particularly if you believe that the role of the investor is to understand value and changes in free cash flow, then our problems to be solved are not that different than the CEO, the head of marketing, and the other C-suites of any given company. They're very much worried on what our opinions are going to be of their company, and their goal is to drive shareholder value. And therefore, as they go about uh, deploying machine learning to solve the problems that they have of customer retention, of fraud mitigation, of churn, et cetera, et cetera, they are teaching these machines tremendous approaches. They are teaching them how it is that their CEO views their business. And so not only are they learning a very generalizable skill set, they are learning a very specific skill set. And as investors, that specific skill set of how a machine is understanding what really matters to the CFO or the CEO of a given company, why should we think that that is any different than what should really matter to us? 
If we understand what a firm is really scared about, well, we should know that if that thing ever happens, we need to go short as soon as possible. And that is really what the machines are being able to do uh, as they drive into each one of these industries. Now, what's the problem with that? In the same way that each one of you are giving out all this information, and it's not necessarily being connected, but it will be in five to 10 years, each one of these different algorithms are being done by different companies and you know, different people. And therefore, the, the knowledge that they have amassed is siloed in whatever vertical or whichever company that they have. That will change. That's a part of the data economy. People will start to expose that in terms of, I'm the best of specialty understanding of the consumer beverage uh, skill sets. And if people want access to my algorithms, there will be some shared platform that is essentially the bank of the future that enables people from when in the 1950s our most valuable asset was cash and gold, now our most valuable assets are intellectual property. And there will be some level of an intermediary uh, that stands in between such that people like us don't have to go about creating our entire uh, approach to understanding from a machine learning perspective a given industry. Uh, we can take uh, some of the building blocks that have been created and then continue to build that for our own uh, purposes. That really is the vision that we have here. Uh, that everybody working in their selfish best interest will create an economy and an ecosystem uh, that enables the, the sharing of knowledge in a manner that people uh, don't view as competitively threatening. And through that, we shall all get to another level that by our own would not have been able to be achieved. Uh, so this is critically important. I'm paying a lot of attention uh, to the advancements of machine learning in every given industry. And we are paying a lot of attention as to, back to our theme of God API, how can we create an API uh, to leverage some of those learnings and generalizable and specific skill sets? So when you step back and you think about what does that mean for the future of, of investing in the data economy, what it means is that at the end of the day, like most things, we'll be very beholden to the machines. Uh, and it won't just be the high frequency and the quantitative trading, it shall be anybody who wants to play in this environment. And everybody at some level, regardless for their process flow of seeking value, optimizing structure, managing risk, optimizing the execution, uh, managing the monitoring and the intervention, and then executing at the best risk adjusted price, they will have to rely on some level of machine learning algorithms with an incredible focus on new data sources and the ability to pull in all these things that previously had been obfuscated to us. And then what that will do is create tremendous focuses on the cutting edge technologies that drive that. Uh, in the same manner that in Silicon Valley, that's all that drives that culture, that will be all that drives here. And what that will require is a tremendous reorganization of the way that processes work, the definition of front versus back office. You know, give, to take analog, the first product that we created at JP Morgan was around collateral management and big data approaches to collateral management. And the idea was that we're all sitting on these huge securities um, that we're not really doing much with because we don't know, you know what the relationships are of our securities, what's hard to borrow and the not. And even just taking that asset that is sitting in the back office and dragging on our returns and thinking about that as its own standalone revenue opportunity and through a SEC lending approach, these are the new types of things that will enable people to be more innovative uh, and to drive greater returns um, by leveraging the fixed costs that they create. So that's essentially you know, the future of the, the quantitative investing in, in the data economy from my perspective. Um, and what I'd love to do, just to end this, and I really hope to open this up and have an uh, interactive conversation. How much time do we have left? Uh, 12 minutes. Perfect. Um, so this will take about five minutes, and then I'd love to spend the net remaining seven just having an interactive conversation about ways that we can drive this to uh, uh, fruition. So we'll start back where we, uh, where we started, uh, or we'll end where we started. You know, I am a student of history. I'm an uh, economics major by uh, training. And therefore, I have spent a lot of time focusing in on the Industrial Revolution. And the thing about J.P. Morgan, uh, the person, not the entity, that I tremendously respected was that because he, after he was viewed as bailing out the U.S. economy um, after the, the uh, panic of 1873, J.P. Morgan had a tremendous ability to determine where capital was going to be allocated and where capital was not going to be allocated. And what he did was that every time he was very big about spurring competition in any given industry. But once in competition got to a level that he thought that it was being destructive, he was very big about trying to pull away some of that funding 
for the industry to try to hope to drive some standards such that whatever their input, because he realized that whatever that industry was, was just an input to another industry that was going to come. So at a certain point, he wanted to drive some level of standards so that the next industry should come above that. Uh, and so these are a couple of the suggestions that I have, not just for fintech startups, but for any company that is looking to prosper in the data economy. Um, and I will focus in on probably just about three of them, uh, but uh, in the open conversation, I'd love to hit on any of those other ones. And the first three that I'd really like to focus in on is, first, we really have to have an intense focus around standardizing industry taxonomies. It's not really driving competitive differentiation, but it does drive overhead in the workflow. Um, the second thing is that people need to kind of, you know, there's a, I grew up in Brooklyn, there was a phrase we used, which was, stay in your lane. Right? Um, there are, people need to figure out what is it that they're going to be the best at, and they need to really be the best at that. Try to own that vertical before you start driving out into other things. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're going to end up getting uh, usurped by a new entrant. And then the final thing that I really want to highlight, because it's personally driving me crazy, is taking responsibility for the, ra the veracity of the information that one provides. Uh, and we can drive through the rest of these if, if that comes up here, although I cannot, coming through my J.P. Morgan context, Anything that does not involve focus on permissible data use rights, I would feel remiss for not mentioning. So let's talk about standardizing industry taxonomies. So if you think back to the Industrial Revolution, what is it that really got it started? It was the railroads, right? And the railroads came, and at the beginning, when there was really nothing here, they started to grow on the East Coast, really connecting the East Coast, and then eventually they crossed the Mississippi. Um, and not only did they create an ecosystem such that the little economy that was taking place in Philadelphia could now be connected with the little economy that was taking place in Cleveland, and therefore they could have cross-functionality in a bigger addressable market, thus growing each other higher than they otherwise would be able to do on their own. But what I'm really interested in and what ties to this is that think about a railroad track. They're all the same width, they're all the same height. What that creates is that if you have a train that's sitting down in Alabama somewhere and you have a train that's sitting up in Cleveland, they're essentially the same at the chassis level. So that as the tracks continue to expand, those trains can continue to flow through that. That standardization drove the entire industrial revolution because then the component makers started to understand what is it that I need to fit my specifications to and they could start to become specialists in that and these huge monolithic companies that were being created by the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, stood a chance of being usurped by people who were specialists at very specific components of their chain. And obviously, competitive laws were different back then, and Rockefeller could just drive everybody out if he so chose. Uh, but that really is what it's about. Same thing with what Ford did. The focus on the specialization of the production plant enabled him to produce cars at a much lower cost get that out to people, and more importantly, the fact that roads were all kind of pavement and the likes enabled people to take their cars and know that they could drive it and not be worried about the terrain of their neighborhood versus another. This, these standardizations are what enabled the growth of our great country today, and we need to have some level of that. So in our context, on a very simple level, everybody here, if you're an asset manager, at the end of the day, we invest in companies or something tied to a company. So the ISIN was created a long time ago, right? It's fairly unique. It, it's transferable across different companies. People like to say, oh, well, if I have my unique identifier, I can have, you know, higher uh, barriers to entry around that. At the end of the day, we're all going to create our own linkages around there, and you should either figure out how can you integrate yourself into the data economy, or you can try to create a little silo off there. If your data is that important from day one that people will enable you to have that silo, so be it. But I guarantee you that will... Uh, end, and it's most important, as I heard from the Robinhood people earlier today, to really think about how to integrate your information into other workflows, and that required some level of a standardization. We've created algorithms to deal with that, um, but I'd love to be able to reduce our time working on that stuff by 10% if other people would just take a more serious approach to this. The second thing around be best at depth of information for a given vertical. So what this shows here is sentiment. Who cares, right? Uh, and you see Apple and you see a day where the stock price uh, jumped up and coming off down. Now, how can you identify what that's about? There were 200 different uh, articles that came out. Some were neutral, some were negative, some were positive. Unless you know what that's talking about, what are you supposed to do with that? You know? So uh, it's really important that people, you know, before they decide to move into another vertical, leveraging some fairly superficial analysis, 
uh, because they just want to capture some growth and they think that they can do it because they came up with some nice back-tested strategy that shows that it has a return. No, like, you have to dive deeper because in the world of fundamental investors, yeah, humans want things on an aggregated level. Machines want the deepest level of granularity that's, that is possible such that they can come up with their own understandings and that's critically important. And if you do do that and you do have a level of coming down to focusing in on the level of detail uh, and not just some level of high level aggregation, well then it's critically important that people take responsibility for their veracity. Right? And what does that mean in that context? In that back, and you know, this is a little pain point of mine, I, I think that people are spending too much time creating back tests and trying to show to us that there's something nice there. Right? What's most important is that whatever it is you say it does, it does. Right? If you're a satellite imaging provider and you're thinking about how many cars are in a parking lot, well, don't spend time telling me how that's going to turn into a return. I know it'll turn into a return if it's correct. Right? Show me why it's correct and focus only in on that. Right, we have to be able to rely on this. And the reason that I, I, I point to this uh, June date in 1874 is that Andrew Carnegie revolutionized the world through steel. But he didn't intend to. The only reason that he came into steel was that he was in the bridge building business. And at the time, there was no bridge because they were built out of iron that could cross the Mississippi and thereby connecting the East Coast to the West Coast. They kept falling down. And so he then came across this thing called steel, and it seemed to be able to last. But the problem was, because there was so much junk out there in the market, which frankly there's a lot of junk out there right now in terms of data, nobody trusted in him. But there was this whole philosophy that an elephant was so smart it would never cross an unstable structure. And so he took this parade of elephants and he crossed his bridge. And after that, everybody understood that steel was this new thing that had the ability to cross previously insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles. And through there, he switched out of the bridge building and went to uh, building steel and laying that all throughout our country uh, in the way that we see all around us. And it is that requirement of really proving that these things work, really standing up for the danger that you are putting other people in. I have to do that every day. If we're down, our investors are calling us. Right? Uh, we deploy millions of dollars every single day under the idea and the guise that the data economy is going to revolutionize the way that capital is allocated. And when we are wrong, I have to stand up and say we were wrong for these reasons. And when we're right, nobody really calls me. So, <laughs> you know, so what is critically important here in the same manner that, you know, Carnegie, or, uh, Van Carnegie was able to take this one moment in history and truly revolutionize the world for the rest of us, this is the moment that we are in today. We are in the moment where for 10, 20 years, academics have been talking about this stuff. But it's just recently that very strong and respected practitioners have actually put their money where their mouths are and have actually dived deeply into deploying capital based upon these types of architectures. And so that's really, again, why we're here. We're here for our Andrew Carnegie moment. We raised our capital. We've all come together. Uh, we've all eschewed uh, other opportunities because we know that this is what is going to drive the next generation of our economy. We're positioning ourselves for that. And we understand that versus when we were sitting at large organizations and it was just anything you wanted to go do, you technically could do from a capital perspective, just not from an organizational perspective. We now have the ability to do anything that we truly believe in from an organizational perspective. However, we don't have unlimited pockets. Right? And therefore, our goal is to find other parties that believe in the things that we just spoke about, that believe about the way that Napoleon is going to speak about this after that, and either have said, yes, I'm going through the same issues, or say, hey, I'd really like to go through the same issues. And if through that understanding you've identified your selfish best interests and identified how that may be congruent with ours, please, let's join. Let's join forces. We're in a phase in the world where it's really about category awareness and not brand differentiation. All that we have to do as a collective industry is decide that we are going to devote ourselves to the opportunities that the data economy presents for us and to be able to amass the skill sets to uh, execute upon that. If we can do that collectively, imagine the new economy that is going to come out of that. And a world that was previously driven by technologists on the West Coast driving forward the innovations, the East Coast needs to come and take its, its place at the table and drive this forward in a manner that can be truly scalable and robust. 
And the best part about the asset management industry is at the end of the day, all our investors want us to do is to take their money and turn it into more money. We have to decide what is the best way to do that. And when you have that real quick feedback loop, we can actually take the chances that others could not do because we can put together the return on invested capital case behind it. So with that said, please join us on this vision. Join us on this journey. There is room for all of us here, at least for the next 10 years. In 10 years, we can start worrying about brand differentiation. But for right now, we just have to build the army that is going to lay down the tracks in the same way that in the 1880s, nearly 60% of the US workforce was deployed under the building of that, that economy. So hopefully people understand, believe, uh, and if you don't and you criticize, especially you, please send us an email. Uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. So I think we have one minute for questions. Any questions? Sure. Um, so you, at the beginning of your talk, you spoke a lot about being impressed by things like AlphaGo and sort of the advances in machine learning. And uh, as an engineer who works on this kind of stuff, my immediate response to that was going to be is that part of the reason why that's sort of technically feasible is there's a natural shared representation for problems like Go and problems like image recognition, where, where we sort of have these standardized ways of thinking about it and talking about it and representing data. Yes. So I was. Uh, initially skeptical and then excited when you got to the end where you were talking about the, the desperate need to standardize on the representation of the data. Um, well, good. I'm glad you stayed then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I, I wonder, for some, some, something like uh, Securities Masters, right? Like er, anyone who does any kind of financial engineering has to work with this problem and it's sort of a nasty, thorny problem because you've got bank standards and then we need to do standard now we have 10 standards. Yes. Um, I can imagine that being sort of collectivized. Um, because that's really just sort of like a deciding to share a naming scheme. I'm wondering if you have um, thoughts or expectations for you. You also talked a lot about the need for sort of like more granular and the ability to sort of share and talk about more complex data coming from all these different APIs. Yes. Um, are you optimistic that we'll be able to have similar kinds of shared sort of standardized representations for this much more sort of free flowing like graph type data? Yeah, so actually I am, but I look at the world a little bit differently, yep. which is I believe that the answer to every question is yes, right? Uh, particularly everything that I want to see happen. And therefore, in order to take the emotions out of that, I look at it through a context of what do you have to believe to justify that yes. So let's talk about one or two of the what you have to believe in order to get to that. The first thing there is why I focused on permissible data use rights. The number one reason that people are concerned about stuff like this is that once you kind of get it out there, it's impossible to figure out how to get it back, right? That is something that will change, right? In terms of the attribution, the managements of the entitlements, and particularly with Docker technologies, where you can have, or, you know, Docker and other types of, uh, these types of technologies, which enables you to have a shared representation and understanding, but still to have uh, the underlines of the information private to where everyone is. Uh, so I think that that's one of the things that you have to believe. The other thing that you have to believe is that there is going to be an organization, and I don't think it's us, I don't, maybe it could be Quantopia, um, that believes that this is a big enough pain point that they want to focus themselves upon creating a revenue stream entirely around that. I can't stand in the way because I don't know that people would really trust that we're being a truly beneficiary third party when we are going to seek to extract so much value out of that. But there is, and that's why I went back to the banks in terms of that idea of somebody, the idea that banks are being turned into a utility is not the worst thing. Right? that they will come into this, whether it's a bank or some other entity, that can stand as all we stand for is privacy, permissible data use rights, and a structured way to do these types of sharings. If those two things occur, three things really, respect for permissible data use rights, the ability to really intelligently manage entitlements and pull back information based upon that, which will require some level of encryption and unencryption based upon the keys in the entitlement phase, then I think that can occur. And then when those two enabling approaches occur, then all you need is an entrepreneur who is really dedicated towards that, which is one of the reasons that I'm up here talking about it. And if there's somebody online looking at it and you want to create this, shoot us an email. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much.